Welcome to The Road. This is Daryl Eden, founding pastor of Mistress of Men. Thank you so much for taking your time to spend this time with me together around God's Word. What a privilege and a pleasure it is to share God's Word with you. Now, The Row, the title of this particular program, The Row, actually means reaching out with Word. So The Row is actually a, an outreach ministry from Missions to Men. I'm the founding pastor of Missions to Men, and here at The Row, reaching out with Word, it gives us an opportunity to reach people like yourself and I from all over the world that they can now chime in, uh, watch the broadcast, and, and, and we all can learn how to change our patterns of thinking to be successful by using God's Word. As always, just a few disclaimers. I know I don't know everything, and I'm okay with that. And I could be wrong, and I know I'm not perfect, and I'm okay with that also. But the same applies to you. So what that means is that we both have to find the opportunity to take the time on purpose that God can talk to us directly because we all need Him, okay? Now, we have books, we have CDs, I have DVDs out there. I would like to make all of the resources from this ministry available to you. If you'd like to participate or if you'd like to receive any of these products, there's, there's three ways you can do it. You can actually write us at P.O. Box 93478 in the city of Industry, California. That's 91715. Again, that's P.O. Box 93478 in the city of Industry, California, 91715, and address it to the row. Or you can email us at info at missions to men.org. That's our email address. All you have to do is send an email, request anything that we would have, or if you have any questions concerning even this broadcast, please email us so that we'll know. First off, either we're being relative or we need to add further explanation to some things for you and anything that you would need that you, that, that you would need from us to help you and assist you in changing your patterns of thinking. Also, you can go to our website. That is missionstomen.org. Listen, I want to hear from you. I don't think it's really enough for me just to sit here and be able to broadcast and give this information out to you and really not to hear from you. I want you to get involved in what we're doing. Also, by way of your monetary gifts of love and your prayers and support, if this ministry, this broadcast is any value to, to you in any shape, form, or fashion, I would want you to take advantage of the opportunity to get involved. And your part of getting involved is, first off, letting us hear from you. Let us know if it's relevant. If it's something that you want to hear, for something that, that that something else that you want to know, or again, questions that you will have about changing your patterns of thinking. And secondly, you get involved again by way of your gifts of love, your monetary gifts of love, and your prayers and support with us. Don't not take the opportunity to get involved with ministry. We teach on Skid Row. Uh, I'm a Protestant pastor at Los Angeles County Men's Central Jail. I teach at, at the uh, Terminal Island Federal Prison. So, so I, I'm doing what God has called us to do as far as ministry. We're reaching out to the least of them. And your participation allows us to do it. And you get credit for everything that's done in the kingdom because of your participation. Amen. Now with that, let's go to my thread. Anytime I teach, I always start off with Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, this is the scripture, this is the thread whereby I find myself through the rest of the scriptures. This is the foundational scripture for missions to men. Uh, God gave me this scripture for the basis of what I do and what I teach on. I teach on the soul of man, not just your spirit and not just your body, but I teach on your soul. Your soul and your spirit are two different things. Your soul is your mind, your will, your imagination, your emotions, and your intellect. That is your soul. Your soul consists of your mind, your will, your imagination, your emotions, and your intellect. That's your soul. And that is housed in your brain, not your spirit. Your spirit is what God changes when you're born again. Your spirit is housed in your heart. Your soul is housed in your head. And I'm telling you right now, a lot of Christians are stuck on stupid. So let's go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. And anytime I say something that you don't like it, if you find it to be derogative or condescending, listen, some things I'm not going to apologize for only because this is my personality and God has given me this particular dynamics in order to teach his word. Everybody's not going to listen to the row, and I understand that. Everybody's not going to go to church, and I understand that. But that does not mean that God's trying to get something to you that you need directly. And all I would ask is that be willing to go and get what you need and stop settling for what you want so that you can get what you need. Here we go. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. If you have it, say, I have it. 
Uh, this is actually, I'm reading from a New King James Version of the Bible. Here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Now, this is actually the Apostle Paul teaching at the church of Philippi to the Philippians, to Christians in Philippi. And Paul has an assignment. When Paul had his Damascus Road experience, you go to Acts Gospel chapter 9. God then sent a prophet, no, no, sent the man of God named uh, Ananias to Paul and told him to lay hands on him so that he could receive his sight and receive the Holy Spirit. After that, Paul went away to, to um, uh, uh, went away for a while, and Paul did not go to the church directly after this. In fact, almost like three years, Paul did his whole pilgrimage and began to do some other things and go and get some other teaching. But then when Paul came back, uh, it says that it says that God told Paul, "Hey, listen, I've get a, I've got to send you far away from here to the Gentiles." So Paul became what we consider now our teacher. Everything that has been pent here in God's Word wasn't just pent for them in Philippi; it's actually for the entire church forever. You have to learn to take the scriptures, pull the principles out so that you can apply them to your life today. It's not enough just to read God's word, memorize God's word. It's really you have to live God's word. That's the power that's in his word is by living it out. Now, with Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 being read, let's go back to the topic I've been teaching on for several weeks. And I'm teaching on the question, does God bless partial disobedience? Well, let me make it very clear. I had a, a very good question on last ses at last week after the session, and I want to thank the person for asking. If there's any of you uh, also that have any questions, always chime in. Again, email us at info at missionstomen.org. You can send any questions that you have, but remember, I don't reply to stupid. So if it's a crazy question, don't look for a reply. But the question was asked, uh, what do you mean by partial disobedience? You know, what what is partial disobedience? Let me, let me make make it very clear to you because it does bear uh, further explanation. When I say partial disobedience, and after I read the verses and scriptures that I'm actually applying this to, first off, God does not bless any disobedience at all. But in the church, and I'm talking about in the body of Christ, we have a lot of denominations. We have a lot of different types of religions. Understand there's four major religions in the whole world. You have Christianity, you have Catholicism, you have Judaism, then you have Islam. Those are the four major religions in the whole world. There are others, but those are the four major. Now, in those four religions, you've got different denominations. Yeah, they're all divided and separated. You know, this person thinks this and this person thinks that. Well, well I want you to know that God does not bless any disobedience at all. So when I use the term partial disobedience, because some people, now I'm talking about my own personal experiences, and I'm talking about some of the environments that I had a chance to be raised in, grew up in, and some of the ministries that I've been a part of in the past. There are some Christians that believe in their minds that because they go to church, because they give an offering, because they have communion on the first Sunday, they, 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 because they go and help other people, they consider that as being morally right and morally good conduct, and that's okay. But at the same time, they're doing things that go totally against God's word. That would be partial disobedience. God can only bless all disobedience and not partial disobedience. So, well, Pastor, what do you mean one more time? Give me another example. Well, now, since you ask, first off, Partial disobedience would be this, and I'm talking about married men, and I teach men all the time. So again, this is how I teach. A married man cannot be involved in extramarital affairs, not in this dispensation. Well, I saw in the Bible where David and all them had more than one wife. Okay, fool, go live with David. I'm just letting you know where we live at now. Partial disobedience cannot be blessed by God. Then you may say, well, 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 pastor, you know, I don't lie and I don't cheat. I don't steal. Yeah, but you have bad thoughts about people. See, partial disobedience can't be blessed. That's what I mean by partial disobedience. Then you may say, well, pastor, look, nobody's perfect and, and, and God doesn't even require us to be perfect. No, he does not. And no, we are not. God does not require us to be perfect. And no, we are not perfect. But he does require us to be committed. Ah, Big difference. See, if you're not committed, 
you're going to think that being disobedient when it's convenient for you is okay as long as you're obedient when everybody's watching you or doing your best. No, 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 that's not how this works. That's not how this works. God knows that we're not perfect. That's why he gave us his word so that we can walk this thing out in our life where we live at right now. There's no way that God can bless you if you're partially disobedient. Well, I don't believe that, Pastor. I, you know, I know God blesses me, and it rains on the just as well as the as well as the unjust. That's true. I'm not talking about rain. I'm talking about blessing. Two different things again. So, so again, if you can't change how you think, when I'm teaching on these things, sometimes we 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 go back into our paradigm and what I teach on soul sets. There's some things in our minds and thoughts that we take. And any time we hear information, we can only evaluate that information based off what's already in our mind. That's why you must let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, Son of God's Spirit, Jesus, Son of Man flesh. So if you don't learn how to think like Christ, you cannot act like Jesus. In fact, if you don't know Christ, you don't even know how Jesus acts. You know, there's this cliche out there. Then we'll go to the scriptures and, and define some more about this. There's a cliche out there. What would Jesus do? and a lot of wristbands and things with WWJD on it. Listen, I think that's very admirable. I would, I, I want to even commend the person, uh, you know, that even started that whole slogan. Uh, uh, all the plethora of things that have come out of WWJD. But I'm going to tell you right now, as a believer, as, as a born-again, spirit-filled believer, as a Christian, as a child of God, you should never have to have a question of what would Jesus do. No. If you know his character, you know what he's going to do. The word of God says that he's, he always did what was pleasing to his father. How are you going to ask the question, what would Jesus do? I know what he's going to do. He's going to please his father. Total obedience, no partial disobedience at all. So if you have to ask the question, what would Jesus do? That's a very good indicator. You don't know who Christ is, who the son of God is. Very good indicator. Very good indicator. So you always know what he's going to do. That's why it says that God, the question was, does God bless partial disobedience? We see out of the scriptures very definitively. It says that Jesus always did what was pleasing to his father. Total obedience, no partial disobedience. Now, let's go to the scriptures that I've been using over the past several sessions because I want you to understand why I ask that question. Again, it comes out of me and some of my own experiences, uh, counseling. I talk to men and I talk to women. My wife and I, we counsel couples. And it is so amazing how crazy Christians are. Absolutely amazing. They think it's okay to sin and think it's okay to keep coming to church in sin. And, and, and as Christians are crazy. As I say, now, I, I want to make sure you're clear with this. Okay, now watch. Now, let's go with all of that being said. Let's go to the book of Luke, Gospel chapter 5. And this is where I launched off from several sessions ago because I wanted you to understand why I had the question on the table and what it is that we have to deal with real time where we live at now. Here in the book of Luke, Luke begins to share. Now, remember, Luke would be like you and I. Luke never met Jesus at all. So I like reading the book of Luke because Luke was very well educated. Uh, I consider this to be part of his doctoral thesis. Uh, Luke actually did some extensive study, uh, investigation, and research to be able to pin this particular letter. Uh, Luke took time to go around and travel and get eyewitness accounts. So Luke has a pretty good grab from a natural perspective on who Jesus was. But then from a spiritual perspective, I believe God used him because we know that this is the inspired word of God and God used people to write it, but it was inspired by his spirit. So Luke himself did not come up with this on his own. Now, here's what Luke says. Watch this. Here in the book of Luke, Gospel, chapter 5. Now, that's some pretty good teaching. Some of y'all didn't know who Luke was anyway, so uh, you didn't know. You just read Luke and think it's all, you know, anyway. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 1 says, so it was, as the multitude pressed about him, talking about Jesus, to hear the word of God. See, this is what you have to always be interested in. And if you're going to hear the word of God, again, that's because you have a desire to know who his son is. 
his son is his word. It says that the word is God and the word was with God and the word became flesh, meaning the word is God, meaning the word is his son, Christ. That's what the word is. So anytime you want to hear God's word, that means you want to hear about Christ. So, not Jesus. I, I, I maybe have to come back and teach on that paradigm. But there's, they're not separate. You can't have Christ without Jesus. You can't have Jesus without Christ. You just have to know the dynamics. You can't separate them. You just have to know the dynamics. All right, here we go. One more time. Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verse number 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, say to learn about Christ, that he, Christ, Jesus, stood by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw these two boats. Now, he's standing by the lake. Get this picture in your mind. You know, standing by the lake, and he sees these two boats. But the fishermen had gone from them and wash, and were washing their nets. See, that means that these two boats were there, and, and he looked at them, but he said the fishermen were gone away from here, but they were washing their nets, nets plural. The fishermen of these boats were gone, and they were washing their nets. Now, watch this. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him, asked Simon to put it out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes by the boat because this is the ones who were gathering around him because they wanted to hear more about the word of God. They wanted to hear more about who Christ was. When he, Jesus, stopped speaking, verse number four, this is Luke's gospel, chapter five, verse four. When he, Jesus, had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, here I have been taught, man, for many, many years that this nets means two. And I don't know if it means two to you, but in all of my English classes that I ever took anytime, or have taken in the past, anytime there was an S behind the word, it always meant plural. It always meant at least two, if not more. But it had to mean at least two. It meant more than one. Whatever comes after one, it means at least more than one. At least that many, all right? So I guess we concur. If we don't concur, then go back to English class. It says here one more time, verse 4 says, When he stopped speaking, he, Jesus, said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets. But Simon answered, watch this, but Simon answered, watch this, but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And here's why I says that I have been taught in the past that if Simon, and this is Simon Peter, if he would have been obedient, that when he did let down the nets, he would have caught more fish. Well, I believe that Simon owned both of these boats. I believe that Simon was only washing one of the nets that he had taken off the boat at a time. They had been out all night fishing. Remember now, they've been out all night fishing. They may have had two, three, four, five nets on the boat, but they were washing their nets, plural, on the shore when Jesus came up. We don't know how many nets that was. It was just more than one. It was very definitive that there was only two boats that he was looking at, and the fishermen, more than one fisherman, had gone. But we know it's just two boats and nets. Then it goes on to say here even more, it goes on to say even more here, that, that when we look at this like this, it goes on to say that, verse number five, one more time, but Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Watch this. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish fish in their net and their net was breaking that means just that one net that was on that boat but they had other nets that were still on the shore and there's only one boat out in the water they didn't bring two boats out so partial disobedience god can't bless if you think that simon would have had two nets on that boat and he didn't let down but one net then he would have been partially disobedient and God could not have blessed him. I have to believe that he only had one net on that boat. There was another boat that had a net. So at the end of the day, there were still nets that had been dropped. More than one had been dropped. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Verse six, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled the people who were on the boat with Simon and Jesus. So they signaled to their partners more than one. In the other boat, see, understand, now the other boat can bring another net. 
on the other boat, watch this, to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. So at least they did get the nets in the water. Partial disobedience, God can't bless. Sometimes, you see, when we're looking at God's word, you have to understand that you can't eat it all in one shot. Just like you can't eat an apple or an orange at one time. Take it in pieces. Go and dissect it to where you can understand it. But trust me that God does not bless partial disobedience. Whatever God tells you to do, you have to do it just like that. If he tells you to stop sinning, stop sinning. No matter how you say you're not perfect, you, whatever he tells you to do, that's what you have to do. God does not give us the end from the beginning. God gives us the beginning to take us to the end. Now, he knows the end, but he never gives us how it's going to finish. When he told Abram, he said, Abram, I want you to leave all your people, leave your land. I want you to go somewhere that I'm going to lead you. Now, Abram did not know where he was going to end up, but God showed him enough to get started. That's not being partially disobedient. That's being totally obedient. God will give you enough in order to start you in the direction of your purpose. God will give you enough to start you in the direction of where you need to be going. He's not going to give you the finished product from the, from the beginning because if you need the finished product from the beginning, I would just say, God, give me the finished product. Don't, don't, don't take a brother to all this. We, we don't have to go catch no fish at all. Just bring them up to the shore. If that's how this works, but it doesn't work like that. Okay, all right, one more time, one more time. I'm going to read Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. It says here, so it was, so, so, so it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, wanting to learn about Christ, that he, Jesus, stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down in the boat and taught the multitude from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. See now, ooh, watch this, watch this. Verse 4 says, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. He didn't even tell him to go fishing again. Simon said, listen, he said, listen, we've toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, you know, we're going to do this. In other words, you don't have to go fishing no more when you're obedient. You go and catch. See, 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 I like fishing. I like fishing. And sometimes I go fishing, I don't catch nothing. But I still like fishing. You know, it's just like going to play golf. I like playing golf also. And all it takes out of 18 holes of playing is to hit one good shot, you're going to come back and play golf again. Not a putt. You know, sometimes you get that real long putt like 18, 18 feet away or something like that. But when you can drive a ball, you know, you got a par five, 560 yards, and you drive a ball and you can make par. Now, I don't make par on par fives often. So that's a good day for me. So likewise, when I go fishing, if you go deep sea fishing, you almost pretty much guaranteed to catch something. Now, it may not always be as big as you want, but pretty much if you go deep sea fishing, especially rock codding, you're pretty much guaranteed to catch something. But freshwater fishing is a little bit different. See, freshwater fishing, you're using one line, one hook, one bait at one time. You might catch something, you might not catch something. And you could be out there all day and catch not a thing. But that's because you're fishing. You didn't go out for a draw. See, he says, let down your net for a draw. I have to believe that the power of God drew all those fish to that net. See, God, he says, just let down your net for a draw. Let it down, and I'm going to draw the fish to the net. You don't have to go catch them. You don't have to chum the water. Anytime you do what God says, you can walk into the supernatural. When you can get your mind in line with your spirit, you can walk into the supernatural. Simon had to change how he thinks because he changed his patterns of thinking to be successful by using God's word. He said, nevertheless, at your word. So he's using God's word in order to be successful. He stopped fishing in his mind and start catching in his mind. He said, okay, I'm going to let down the net. There was no bait. There was no chum in the water. 
just let down the net for a draw. That net drew the fish, and they were able to catch the fish, not go fishing. They actually went for a draw. Big difference between fishing and drawing. If you go for a draw, it's like going to, you know how you, sometimes we go to these pet stores and we buy our children these guppies and goldfish. The person goes to the aquarium with a net and just draws the fish up for you. Oh, I want that one right there. I want that one right there. This is what that was like. Here is Jesus saying, okay, I know y'all been out there, but you let me use your boat. I taught all these people, and now some of this fish going to feed all this multitude that's over here. Because understand, if I bring all these fish back, you can't use them all. And because they were in business, now this is just me personally. Now this is, this is on the side. You ever say, pastor, this is your personal opinion. I believe they made some money off these fish. These men were in business. They fished all night and made nothing at all. Now they go out and get so much fish that almost both of the boats are sinking. These boys came up, man. Uh, uh, Dr. Bill Winston teaches on, 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 on accelerated wealth. Now, this right here, I get that. I, I get it. No, boom, just like that. I get it. So, so, so I just want you to know that God does not bless partial disobedience. And what I mean by partial disobedience, I mean exactly this. You have to be totally obedient to what God tells you. Partial disobedience will not allow the blessings to operate in your life. So I trust that that's clear. I trust that I, I shared it and conveyed it in a manner that it adds some significant revelation to your life and some knowledge that maybe you didn't have before. Just, just know this. Again, I don't know everything. I'm an imperfect being and I'm fallible. But if you have any questions at all ever about anything that I teach, please send us an email. I want, I want to hear from you. Send us an email at info at missionsdemand.org if you have any questions on what I just finished teaching or if you would like to take advantage of any of the resources in the arsenal of that missions the men have. We want to make sure that you get anything from us necessary to help you change your patterns of thinking to be successful by using God's word. Also, you can write us if you'd like to send a gift of love, a monetary gift to us to help us support this ministry. You can send that to P.O. Box 93478 in the city of Industry, California, 91715. And you can address it to the tension of the row. Also, go to our website, missionsdemand.org. There's tabs you can click on for drop downs if you'd like to order books from us. Again, send us a letter. We want to hear from you. We just want, want, we want you to partner with us in what we're doing here in the kingdom. And until we're together again, everybody repeat this after me. Just say a different future. Yeah, that's not everybody. See, I, can, I, I can't hear you, but I know you out there. Say a different future is possible for me if I'm willing to change my mind. One more time. See, a different future is possible for me if I'm willing to change my mind because the thoughts I take will determine the decisions I make. And my decisions, remember now, my decisions mean not what somebody said about me, not how somebody treats me, and not what they don't do for me. Just like Peter, his decision to let down the net defined his destiny. So my decision will define my destiny. Change my mind. And until we're together again, remember these words from Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen.